1862, following the Battle of Antietam, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves in the Confederate States. After the Civil War, the 13th Amendment freed the slaves in all of the states. These formerly enslaved people were to enjoy the rights of all Americans. In the southern states, though, the white people who made the laws wanted to live separately from the blacks. Separate schools, separate restaurants, separate seating on buses. Standing on the 13th Amendment, African American people challenged these separate facilities in a case known as Plessy v. Ferguson. In 1896, the Supreme Court ruled in Plessy v. Ferguson, making separate facilities legal as long as they were separate but equal. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Brown v. Board of Education that separate but equal was inherently unequal. Requiring separate facilities for different races was no longer legal. To enforce that, though, would be another matter. Even though it was the law of the land, that did not mean that the South was going to go along with it. In December 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, a seamstress named Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on a city bus. Miss Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. The African-American people of Montgomery fought back by starting a boycott. This boycott would be run by the Montgomery Improvement Association. A one-day boycott was organized. That one-day boycott turned into a 12-month boycott. In 1953, a young African-American minister moved to Montgomery. His name was Martin Luther King. The Montgomery Improvement Association saw potential in the young minister. They asked him to lead the boycott, and he accepted. In 1952, another young man moved to Montgomery. His name was Nelson Malden. Mr. Malden came to Montgomery to attend Alabama State College. He would work his way through college cutting hair in a barber shop near Reverend King's church. One day, the young Reverend King walked into Nelson Malden's barber shop. Mr. Malden cut Reverend King's hair that day, and many more times in the future. These are some of Mr. Malden's memories of Reverend King, of the life of the barber shop, and of one of the most successful nonviolent revolutions in the history of America. My name is Nelson Malden. I was born in Pensacola, Florida in 1933. I am the youngest of nine boys. My father was a barber in film school. I guess how he got to be a barber was because he had that many boys. But anyway, I never didn't know exactly how he started cutting, but the youngest three sons was all raised up in the barber shop, Spudgeon and Stephen. I am the youngest of the brothers. I was cutting at this college year barber shop, and I was the youngest barber there. And during that time, I, the youngest barber had a chance to catch all the new customers. And so I was also a student at Alabama State, and one morning I was had a 10 o'clock class and I saw this young man drive up, and it was about 25 minutes to 10, and I never liked to cut another head after 20 minutes to the hour because I had to walk to the campus. So this young man got out of the car, looked at his head when he got out, and I said, oh, heck, I could knock him out at least 15 minutes because I could tell the, the length of his hair. And when he came in, I asked him what was his name. He said, Martin Luther King. I said, where are you from? He said, Atlanta, Georgia. I said, what are you doing in town? He said, I'm here to preach my crowd swimming to Dexter. I said, oh, that's my church. He said, oh, yeah, it's good to meet you. So after I finished cutting his hair, I gave him the mirror to see how he liked his hair cut. And uh, he said, pretty good. So when you tell a barber, pretty good, you know, that's kind of an insult. So he came back two weeks later, and one of the other barbers was vacant. I was busy, but he waited on me that time. And when he got in the chair, I said, that must have been a pretty good haircut. He said, you all right. 